Good evening, everyone. We're so happy to have so many of you join us this evening, and we are really um, excited for a fantastic presentation from Dr. Sarah Stein on dermatitis herpetiformis. I, and I don't, Dr. Stein can correct me if I said that wrong. That was perfect. I, <laughs> I want to introduce myself. I am Rachel Lieberman. I'm a director here at the Celiac Disease Center. And we are so excited to have all of you join us for our series, what we are calling as Dinner with a Doctor. And so this is um, a wonderful opportunity to hear from an expert on a specific area of celiac disease. And so we could not be more excited to have our speaker, Dr. Sarah Stein with us, who is an associate professor of pediatrics and medicine in the section of dermatology. And um, tonight she'll really be giving us a lot of background and education on dermatitis, hep wait, her pediformis, <laughs> um, which is a skin condition, obviously, that is very associated. What I want to tell you about some ground rules. There's a bat, the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A function. We would love for you to submit questions um, that we can cover with Dr. Stein after her presentation. I would like to remind everyone this program is being recorded. So if for any reason you have to drop off, we will be recording this and then posting it on our YouTube channel. And Lindsay will be sending out information about that. But in the Q&A function, it would be best to put your questions. If you submitted them ahead of time, we do have those. And we'll be trying to get to as many questions as we can after our presentation. But we cannot thank Dr. Stein enough for giving up her time and joining us this evening. So Dr. Stein, I would love if you, I want to make sure everyone can see her screen, um, but we are very excited for this presentation. So I would love to hand it over to you. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Rachel and Lindsay for inviting me tonight. And uh, it's a pleasure to talk to everyone about dermatitis herpetiformis and we'll probably call it DH um, through most of the talk. <clears throat> so we'll start off um, very fundamentally with what is dermatitis herpetiformis or DH. Um, and basically this is an effect of gluten sensitivity directly on the skin. And that results in this particular rash, um, which is composed usually of very tiny blisters or water-filled bubbles on the skin which are so itchy for most people that they're scratched off pretty quickly. And so then it looks like little scabs on the skin. Uh, and these tend to affect a very symmetric distribution, usually the over the um, knees, the elbows, uh, often the buttocks or the lower back, and sometimes the upper back of the shoulders as well. In rare cases, it can be more extensive than this, but these locations are really the classic sites of involvement. Here are some more pictures to kind of show what this looks like. As you can see, again, lots of these are kind of like scratched open red bumps on a red base. Uh, in darker skin color, the red will be less uh, bright, may look more purple to brown, uh, depending on the skin tone. So, how are dermatitis herpetiformis, the skin rash, and celiac disease related? Uh, well, about 12% of patients with celiac disease have dermatitis herpetiformis, and about 20% of patients who have dermatitis herpetiformis will actually have intestinal symptoms. So even though all patients with dermatitis herpetiformis will have uh, changes on their gastrointestinal biopsies that fit with celiac disease, only a fraction of those people actually have any significant intestinal symptoms. So here's a kind of a schematic to again, drive home the point that it's a small subset of people with celiac disease who have dermatitis or pediformis. And of those people, a smaller subset actually have uh, much in the way of GI symptoms. Um, and the skin disease, just like the intestinal disease, improves with a gluten-free diet. But it is a lifelong condition and often has an up and down course, which parallels directly with how consistent one is with the gluten-free diet. So who, who is that subset that gets dermatitis or pediformis? 
Well, we know that it seems to affect men slightly more than women. Uh, the same DNA um, haplotypes or genetic um, groups which have these uh, special markers in their DNA, the same that affect those with celiac disease are the same ones that people have that have dermatitis or pediformis. Um, it is more common in those who uh, have a Northern European ancestry. Um, and likewise, it's uncommon actually in African-Americans and Asians. About 10 to 15% of the people who have dermatitis or peniformis have an affected first degree relative. So it does run in families in that to that extent. The average age of onset is um, somewhat variable, generally adulthood. Uh, some references will say 30s to 40s and others even later than that in the 50s. And so it's really pretty uncommon in children and uh, adolescents. And so what causes this rash? So the gluten exposure in the GI tract is what causes production of these specific IgA antibodies that are known as transglutaminase. And you can see in the diagram that when all that gluten is affecting the lining of the intestinal tract, it upsets the, that lining. That's when all that um, antibody production happens. And that's when all of the uh, abnormalities to the lining of the GI tract develop. So <clears throat> the same, uh, so after a long period of in exposure to gluten in the intestines, uh, in addition to those transglutaminase II antibodies, there's another uh, group of antibodies that begin to develop called transglutaminase III. And these are the antibodies that then circulate in the bloodstream and attack the skin. And when they attack the skin, they cause these little water blisters, which you can see um, in the photograph. And under the microscope, when the um, a piece of skin is taken and looked at, at microscopically, it's what you see in this um, second picture. I'm not sure if you can see my, my um, cursor here, but this is the surface of the skin microscopically. And these are big bubbles that are forming close to the surface of the skin. And that's what the blisters are that uh, develop um, that you can see on your skin when you have this rash. Plus there are all these little blue dots these are the inflammatory cells. These are all the um, other blood cells that are upset by this process that are coming to the skin surface and causing uh, all this disruption. Um, and that's all driven by the development of those transglutaminase three antibodies uh, that, that originate in the intestines. So how do we make the diagnosis of dermatitis herpetiformis? Well, it's actually multi-pronged. Um, one needs to have the characteristic features of the rash. And then microscopically, it should look like that picture I just showed you under the microscope. Plus there are some special tests that can be done on the skin, which are called uh, immunofluorescence uh, stains. And those tests can actually identify the antibodies that um, transglutaminase three antibody uh, binding to, to uh, portions of the skin. And so when we see that, then we really feel confirmed um, that this is the diagnosis. And then lastly, patients with this condition should have a rapid response to this medication called Dapsone. Within one to two days, the rash should start disappearing and the itch should go away. And that's um, the all four of those uh, features is what really confirms the diagnosis. So how is this rash treated? Well, a gluten-free diet is um, the um, most uh, definitive treatment, um, but it takes several months of a very strict diet before the rash will respond. And on average, about 11 months of a gluten-free diet before the rash is, can be expected to go away. And that's a long time, and it's a pretty uncomfortable rash. So most people are also treated with a medication called Dapsone, and this particular medicine, we don't really understand why this is so effective for this particular rash, but it must interfere with that particular antibody that is bound to the skin um, very directly. And so it immediately relieves the itch within 48 to 72 hours and uh, stops the rash. Um, or, I'm sorry, the rash will come right back if you stop the medicine. 
Um, and so um, this is, again, as I uh, previously said, almost like a diagnostic test um, in that the patients feel so much relief with this medicine. Um, but it, it, it um, many people would rather not be on this medicine long-term and with a very strict gluten-free diet, um, the medicine usually can be tapered and eventually discontinued for a lot of people and they're able to um, do very well with just the gluten-free diet ultimately. When taking this medication, Dapsone is not an option for an individual. Um, there are some other medicines that can be somewhat helpful, but none are as reliable as Dapsone. Uh, there is actually a topical form of Dapsone, Dapsone gel, which is mostly marketed for treating acne, um, it, it actually, but has had some benefit for some patients with uh, DH. Uh, potent topical steroid medicines, which are used for lots of different kinds of rashes, those can help a bit. Um, st steroid medicines taken orally can help a bit, and other medicines that are taken to sort of suppress the immune system can also help a bit, but none is as effective as Dapsone. Um, so finally, uh, um, there is a question of whether there are other medical conditions that might be also seen more frequently in individuals who have celiac disease and dermatitis herpetiformis. And so there have been some um, multiple things noted. Um, one is thyroid disorders, especially a type of underactive thyroid known as Hashimoto thyroiditis. This is more common in these individuals. Um, also, the enteropathy-associated lymphoma, which is kind of the most feared complication. Um, this is uh, a risk for those who have uh, uncontrolled dermatitis herpetiformis um, and, in, and uh, uncontrolled inflammation in the GI tract. And so the gluten-free diet is protective against this because the um, abnormalities in the intestine really um, normalize uh, in these patients who follow the gluten-free diet. Insulin-dependent diabetes is also more common in patients who have celiac and DH, and pernicious anemia as well, although less common than the other entities. And then there are a whole list of other, what we call autoimmune diseases, um, which seem to happen a little bit more frequently in these patients as well. And I'm just highlighting a couple of uh, classic skin-related ones, which is alopecia areata, which is shown in the top picture here. This is a condition of hair loss where patients will, out of the blue, lose uh, patches of hair, often very round circles of hair um, uh, from both the scalp, but other body parts as well and vitiligo, a condition where there's loss of pigmentation or color in the skin, um, and individuals will develop very white patches of skin. Um, both of these uh, conditions are not uncommon in general, but are a little bit more frequent in patients who also have uh, celiac and dermatitis herpetiformis. So that was what I had planned to cover, and now I'm happy to open it up and address your questions. I'm going to stop sharing my screen at this point. Thank you so much, Dr. Stein. This was amazing. And I want to encourage everyone, please continue to stay on mute and please submit your questions in the Q&A function. And I'm going to turn it over to Lindsay, who has some pre-submitted questions. We'll address those first, but I promise we will also get to our Q&A as well, because you guys have put some fantastic questions. So Lindsay, do you want to get started? Yes, absolutely. Thanks, Dr. Stein. Um, okay, so some when people register, we allow them to um, have an opportunity to ask some questions in advance. So I am going to go through some of those. And like Rachel said, we'll do as many as we can in the time we have. We did have a number of questions that were asked in advance. So let me get started on those. Um, is it possible to still have DH even when following a very strict gluten-free diet? So somebody who really believes that they are not um, accidentally getting gluten, can they still be dealing with DH? So I think not. I think that with an absolutely perfect, which is hard to achieve, gluten-free diet, that the rash would be eradicated. 
Um, so the thought process is maybe they are still inadvertently getting some gluten and they just don't realize it. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. Um, we have somebody here who said that they were diagnosed with the fluorescence test of a blister and then the endoscopy was inconclusive. If they're no longer experiencing blisters with a gluten-free diet, is there any follow-up they should perform? They said their doctor doesn't know what to do. Right. So in fact, it is not necessary to have an endoscopy um, workup if the diagnosis of DH is ma made and confirmed with the skin tests. Um, the skin tests are, you know, if the, especially that immunofluorescence test is very specific and the findings in the GI tract can be very variable. Um, not all patients who have the skin rash will have the uh, blunted villus findings in the GI tract. They may just have some inflammation there that some pathologists may not be confident in calling definitive for celiac. So it's really felt that doing that extra intestinal biopsy, if there are no intestinal symptoms, is not required to make this diagnosis. Um, but the gluten-free diet still needs to be adhered to. Perfect. Great. Thank you. Um, so I have another question that says, this person has celiac disease, and they're wondering if occasional itching could be related to celiac. They don't necessarily have the blisters and all those things that DH presents with, but they do have occasional itching and they're wondering if it could, could it be DH without the blisters? Could it be celiac related? Those kind of things. Yeah, well, I think it's, it's, it's always hard, right? Because there's definitely gonna be patients who have other skin conditions, itchy skin conditions, eczema, for example, who also have celiac disease and how closely those two things are aligned is really not well worked out. So, um, you know, we see a lot of patients who have other disorders like eczema and they try a gluten-free diet in hopes that that's going to clear up their skin rash. Um, but the only one that really is so tightly linked is DH. So if it's a sort of a non-specific itchy rash that doesn't have all the features of DH and you're you're on a very strict gluten-free diet, then it's probably not DH. It's probably just coincidentally that you have something else. You know, that was a little bit of a twisted answer. It's always, a, it's a hard thing to, to, to no. kind of. That's great. No, it's perfect. It's perfect. Thank you. Um, since you mentioned eczema, um, we did have a couple of questions that were kind of related to that. Um, somebody was wondering how frequently is dermatitis herpetiformis misdiagnosed as eczema or psoriasis? Um, I don't have numbers for that, but I am sure that it is. Um, there's uh, The literature does suggest that there's often a long delay for people who have DH in getting the diagnosis. So that suggests that there probably is a good bit of time when it's misdiagnosed. Um, it's tough because again, those little blisters are often not there because they've been scratched away. And so, um, you know, without all the features there, it's hard to, to recognize the rash sometimes. Um, and the biopsies sometimes take multiple times to get the data that one needs from the biopsies. So those, you know, you can have a false negative biopsy. Um, so uh, so it's always challenging um, and um, frustrating, I, I know, for patients. Sure. Um, so also related to the same thing, are any of the treatments that are common for eczema and psoriasis the same as treatments that would be used for dermatitis herpetiformis? Well, um, as I said, sometimes topical steroid medicines will help to relieve dermatitis herpetiformis to some extent, and that would be the standard treatment for psoriasis and for eczema. So yes, people may get relief from those same types of medicines, um, but 
you know, it's, it, it, it is important to finally ultimately get the correct diagnosis because it is so important for the GI health to be on that gluten-free diet. Um, Rachel, did you want to ask a couple of the questions that are in the q and I will. And I want to remind everyone, because I see our chat blowing up too. If you can, if you don't mind, please put your questions in the Q&A function, because we have screens that this is where we're going to be um, kind of focused right now. But I, Dr. Stein, we have our first question, and I'm, I feel like you have definitely address some of this, but let's, I would love, I think sometimes we all need to hear things in different ways. So um, this person has had DH on their elbows and knees, mostly on hands and fingers, totally gone on the gluten-free diet, except for a few tiny spots on the shoulder. Any gluten mishaps expressed first in this patient's fingers? Could it be something other than DH because of where it's presenting? So it's always possible that people can have more than one thing. So that there may be DH that's well controlled with the gluten-free diet. And then maybe there's some hand eczema or something else that's also contributing to some rash elsewhere. Um, so that's always possible, right? These All these entities are pretty common. Eczema is super common. Um, hand eczema can be related to lots of irritants and contactants that we have. So... Um, you know, I, I would wonder about that. Um, and, you know, that would be worth having reevaluated potentially. That's great. Um, can you actually, well, I'll wait for my question at the end. Um, but I was just curious. Oh, no, I'm going. Um, I'm curious, you know, this did come up in a chat, but if someone has DH, Dr. Stein, do you feel this can be diagnosed by a gastroenterologist or yourself? And how do you work with a gastroenterologist like Dr. Ritu Verba, like how do you partner together to treat patients dealing with um, DH? Well, I mean, I think, um, you know, people will come to us from different perspectives. So um, as, as we've said, you know, there are a lot of patients with DH who don't have any intestinal symptoms. So they may not have ever seen an, a gastroenterologist. Um, and then they come to the dermatologist who recognizes the rash and advises them that a gluten-free diet is going to be the best long-term treatment. Um, but the dermatologist may not be the best person to advise on how to follow that gluten-free diet. And that may be a time to bring in the team from gastroenterology who has a lot more experience with how to uh, counsel people on managing the diet. Um, on the other hand, sometimes uh, the gastroenterologist will be sending the dermatologist patients because they have already diagnosed celiac disease and they're wondering if a rash is consistent with DH or not. Mm -hmm. um, and that, then the dermatologist can be very helpful in putting those pieces together. That's great. And I'm um, just curious, I'm going to another question here in the Q&A function. If you're diagnosed with DH, is that something, say you're filling out med, um, medical forms, whether it be for a school or camps or even a job, do you list that um, for medical purposes or just that you have celiac disease? Or do you specifically mention DH as well as a condition? Well, I mean, I think it's completely up to the individual. I think if the DH, you know, if the individual is on a gluten-free diet and their DH is basically in remission because they're... Mm -hmm so well controlled, then there's no need to bring that up as another medical issue. Um, I think it can also be considered just as a symptom of celiac disease. And so if someone is most comfortable just saying they have celiac disease, that's adequate as well. That's great. And, and um, we have a the, question. Rash, the rash doesn't require any precautions. You were, you were asking about school or camp or something. Mm -hmm. you know, there's nothing that the individual needs to be restricted from in terms of activities or contacts or anything with this particular entity. So it isn't necessary, necessarily necessary for camp counselors or camp for personnel, school personnel and nursing to know about. Okay, that's good to know. That's great to know. Is there a reason to avoid iodide or seafood? This was a question in the chat and um, I want to do justice if I'm asking this correctly, but if you had an iodide patch test next to a DH, um, your DH, like maybe you have a lesion, 
is does it affect you at all? Is there a reason to avoid it? I'm not sure I know the answer to that. Yeah. Okay. And that's okay. We can do some digging. Um, but I just wanted to ask because I didn't know if that was something common, but we'll definitely get back to you with hopefully an answer. Does everyone, Dr. Stein, does everyone with DH necessarily have celiac disease? Do you see this present in patients without celiac disease? No, everyone has celiac disease. May not be symptomatic. Okay. The, the, the source for getting DH is having celiac disease. Okay. That is really, that's interesting. That's good to, to know for all of us so that you're right. If they go through it with a rash and you head to a dermatologist, it would be a great indicator to also see a gastroenterologist. Um, what about cosmetics with gluten? And how does that play a role with DH even? Do you have flare-ups because of that? So, um, Nothing topical would be thought to flare the DH. It has to be an exposure internally. Okay. That's good to know. And is there any possible connection with long COVID? And the reason they're asking, they have celiac disease. This patient who's asking the questions, they from celiac got an incredibly itchy rash They have long COVID, which ended up causing thyroid problems, but did not feel they had exposure to gluten, but did present with um, an itchy rash. Um, So I'm not aware of any specific associations between long COVID and DH. Um, If long COVID somehow activated the celiac disease, then, you know, that might be a pathway by which the DH became more activated. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's good to know. Do, um, are there, um, percentages of people with DH that have thyroid cancer or the enteropathy associated lymphoma? Uh, so there is an increased incidence of the enteropathy, the lymphoma, um, you know, or, um, so patients with DH have an increased risk of the lymphoma if they're not following the gluten-free diet, Mm -hmm. Um, but I don't have any figures to specify how many people with DH develop the lymphoma because it all depends on how adherent to the gluten-free diet. Um, Okay. And I am not aware of thyroid cancer being increased in patients with DH. Um, The hypothyroidism due to Hashimoto's thyroiditis, that's where the uh, association is. Fantastic. Thank you. Lindsay, do you want to play tag team and you can take a few of these um, for the Q&A? Yeah, I'm actually going to go back to my previously submitted ones and ask a few of those. Um, So one of the questions is, can people grow out of DH? Is that something that eventually goes away and they can bring gluten back into their diet? This is somebody that I believe um, feels that they've had no issues in the last five to seven years, no more breakouts, nothing like that. So they're wondering if that means it's gone away. No, the uh, unfortunately it is felt to be a lifelong condition and, um, so if you go off of the gluten-free diet, the DH will come back. In time, in time. Um, so likewise, um, can DH start at any age in those that already have a celiac diagnosis? Can you have a celiac diagnosis and then kind of randomly somewhere along the way end up with DH as well? That's a good question. Um I would assume yes, but again, if you have celiac and you are following a very strict gluten-free diet, it shouldn't develop. Um, the thinking is that it's the longer, um, you know, the, the reason why DH is thought to occur at older ages is it's thought that maybe the people who have sort of milder 
GI disease who are, you know, not having enough GI disease to cause them GI symptoms that would drive them to go to the gluten-free diet. They have longer period of exposure to gluten, which slowly over time is what activates those antibodies that then affect the skin. So people who have more severe symptomatology early on are going to you know, switch to a gluten-free diet and protect their gut and they'll never produce the DH antibodies. And so they don't have DH. That's sort of the, the thinking of it. So it seems like it would be less likely for someone who had symptomatic celiac disease and went on a gluten-free diet and to control their symptoms, they wouldn't be expected to later on get DH. Sure. Okay. That's interesting. That makes sense. Um, but if maybe you aren't so great at following the gluten-free diet, then you may, may yeah. likely end up with, okay, perfect. Um, let's see if DH is suspected when and how should a person go about getting tested? Um, who do they go to? What's the process like? Can you talk through that a little bit? Yeah, so they should see a dermatologist because they really need a skin biopsy. And the most important piece of the biopsy is going to be for that immunofluorescence testing. Um, and when the dermatologist takes the sample for that test, they're actually going to take a piece of skin, not from an active spot of rash, but from nearby. Um, because uh, if the rash is, if they, if the specimen where the rash is very active, may not show those antibodies. They'll be um, kind of consumed by all the inflammation that's going on there. So it really needs to be from a little patch of, of normal appearing skin. Okay, perfect. Um, can DH appear after gluten exposure sometimes, but not every time? Is it is there a timeline that it would show up after you've been exposed? Some of those kind of timeline things. Well, so I think we kind of covered a little bit of that in terms of, um, yes, if you're not following a strict gluten-free diet, then over time, you may be someone who will develop DH because of that long-term ex uh, exposure to the gluten. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're someone who kind of goes on and off your gluten-free diet, that also I think would raise the risks of having flare-ups of the skin rash. Does that answer, address it? Yes. Um, somebody was wondering if there's any active clinical trials for DH right now. I don't know if you know that answer or not. I don't. Um, and you know, again, we, we know what the treatment for this is. It's a gluten-free diet. So I'm not sure where what what we would be investigating. Well, our crowd is used to talking about the clinical trials involved with celiac disease, which of course there's medications and there's you know all those things that are in the middle of trials. So I I suspect somebody was hoping that maybe even one of the celiac trials would um, also benefit DH. So it's possible. I I am I'm not. I did not look into that before tonight, so I can't. I stand That's fine. On. That's fine. No problem. Um, let's see. So I have a question, Dr. Stein. Can you talk to me a little bit once you're diagnosed? And it sounds like this is something that you have to manage for your life. What does follow up look like for a patient living with DH? And what do you recommend? Um, well, so, I mean, I think, again, the biggest risks are in the GI tract. So following with your gastroenterologist to make sure that um, there isn't, aren't any changes happening there that are of concern. Um, uh, talking with your dermatologist, if you're having trouble maintaining your rash, um, you know, they may have other suggestions, some of these other topicals, if you need something a little bit extra, because it's difficult to maintain that absolutely strict diet. Um, and then if you're getting other types of rashes um, that don't fit with your DH rash, um, then those are other things that the dermatologist could help to address. That's great. Thank you. 
Um, can you, this is an interesting question. So what are your feelings on, in quotation, growing out of DH? Um, this patient mentions they had DH for 10 plus years. Anytime they got gluten, you know, they would obviously have a flare up, but in the past 10 years, no DH, and they are sure they've actually gotten gluten once in a while. Oh, I'm happy for them that they're not getting DH anymore because it's miserable. Um, but, uh, you know, the literature mostly says that this is considered a lifelong thing. So, you know, it's possible maybe that that there's just not enough gluten sneaking in to get back to the point of triggering the rash. Okay, great. Um, that's fantastic. Thank you for that answer. Um, and Lindsay, I'm going to ask one more, and then I know you have, you're going to go through a lot more of the, this Q&A. Um, and Dr. Stein, you're doing amazing. I just want to pause and say, we're firing things at you. Yeah. But this, people are really hungry for this knowledge. And I'd love to see how active the Q&A function is in our chat, because this is obviously a topic I feel like we don't spend enough time on. And it affects a lot of people living with celiac disease. So I want to thank you. Take a breath and thank you um, because this is fantastic. Um, but I just, you know, this patient actually mentions they had terrible skin blisters on chest and arms. The dermatologist biopsied and did not find DH. However, this patient went on a gluten-free diet. It completely cleared. Should this patient assume it's DH? It came back when they did a gluten challenge and then went away after that. So perhaps That's they have. They sound yeah. very suggestive. Um, so, you know, it, I, sometimes the biopsies, you know, just miss it. So it's possible that that biopsy that was done just wasn't from a ideal location um, and, you know, might be worth considering rebiopsying. Um, mm -hmm. The, the data also suggests that you don't necessarily have to be on, a, be on a diet getting gluten when you have your biopsy done. So those antibodies uh, hang around in the skin for months, even maybe years after being on a gluten-free diet. So one wouldn't necessarily have to provoke the rash to necessarily get a diagnostic biopsy. But um, but it also sounds like, you know, just from the history that that's pretty suggestive and, you know, would support the individual maintaining that gluten-free diet. Thank you. Thank you. Lindsay, I'm going to let you take over some of these. Okay. Um, let's see. We still have quite a few here. Um, oh, sorry. Just the looking through. Um, well, sorry, Lindsay, Rachel, well, I was looking me. for the one that you just mentioned. Oh, yes. So um, we had one just come through and I think this is interesting because it kind of addresses the genetic factor about celiac disease and um, children. So Dr. Stein, patient has DH and celiac. One of their children was just diagnosed with celiac at age five. Child is now 13. So the five-year-old when they were diagnosed is now 13. Does this, does her child have a higher risk of developing DH later in life? Particularly if she does stray away from a gluten-free diet at some point? Um, I think it's hard to say. I mean, only about 10% um, of people with DH have the family history. So I don't think that... Um, having a family history necessarily uh, define, you know, um, means you're going to have DH. Uh, and the earlier you're diagnosed with DH, the better chance that you're going to be limiting your gluten exposure, which should decrease your chances of DH. And in fact, what we've seen just uh, statistically over time is that the incidence of DH is going down. So fewer and fewer people are having DH while the diagnosis of celiac disease is going up because we've gotten much, much better at diagnosing celiac disease. So that's very hopeful that 
the earlier we diagnose celiac disease, the less likely that those people will go on to have DH. That is promising. That's actually a promising statistic. You're right. Yeah. So we're doing our job, everyone. <laughs> Keep getting diagnosed. Lindsay, go ahead. Um, so I think Rachel had asked a question earlier, and I think that the person who asked the question may have uh, mistyped. So it looks like the question is actually about iodine. Um, is there some connection with iodine? We've got a number of people who are asking about iodine and if it worsens things or not, apparently they're hearing it does or have experienced maybe themselves that they felt it did. Is there any connection there? I don't know. I, I, I don't want to give an answer to that because I just, I'm not sure about that. I I'd have to do some digging to look into that. Okay. Yeah, we did. We had a couple of people that specifically mentioned iodine. And so it, I guess in their research, they're finding something like that themselves. And we're wondering if there was anything you could add. Um, okay. I also have somebody who mentioned if what the, what the differences are between shingles and DH and could a doctor mistake the two? And this came from somebody who actually had shingles. Um, they have celiac, they were diagnosed with shingles, but they're skeptical and they actually are wondering if it was DH and if that mistake could be made. Um, so I think that that would be unusual to mistake the two things. Certainly shingles, is an eruption that has a lot of little blisters at the beginning, um, but it's usually a very limited distribution, usually only on one side of the body. And it's a limited duration rash. It generally dries up and fades away within a couple of weeks um, and is associated with, rather than itch, it is a very painful rash. Um, because uh, shingles is is uh, caused by reactivation of a virus in the skin, the same virus that causes chicken pox, uh, reactivates in the skin and causes a very limited kind of chicken pox type rash, um, but usually only on one side of the body at a time. It's usually very painful. And then it kind of subsides over a couple of weeks. So a kind of a very different time course typically then DH and a very different distribution. Okay, good, thank you, that's that's helpful. Um, I have somebody else who said that they thought they had DH, but the rash that they get isn't blistering and it's on their face and their stomach and they seem to connect it to some, when they're having dairy, they, they say they're dairy intolerant as well as celiac. Are there any skin issues that celiac patients with dairy intolerance get? Because now they're questioning whether it actually was DH or not. Right. So again, that description sounds very atypical or unusual for DH. So I also would wonder if that, you know, was truly DH. Um, you know, some people who have sensitivity to dairy might also have a tendency to eczema. And eczema rashes can certainly affect face and stomach and lots of other body parts and would be, again, very itchy, generally not so blistery. Um, so perhaps this is individuals having more of eczema flare-ups and, and not DH. Okay, that's good to know. Um, okay. I, I have one. Dr. Stein, does it, you know, when someone's having a flare-up of DH, does it matter how much gluten they could be exposed to before they have an outbreak or does that vary person to person? Hmm. Uh, I think that's really hard to say um, because it's really, I, you know, I'm, I'm not sure how, um, if there's ever actually been, you know, any studies done on sort of a dose response kind of effect. Um, so I, I think it's hard to say. Um, yeah, no, I, some of these we're not going to have, you know, I think when you're searching for answers and when you're managing chronic things, I think sometimes you are curious what, you know, makes something flare at some points and not at others. It's, 
you know, it's, we are all searching for answers, I think, to obviously avoid for the future. So it's good to know. And when you have a flare up, this is an environmental question. Does sunlight exposure aggravate the DH um, at all or any type of environmental factors, the rash itself or no? No, I don't think so. I think this this is purely precipitated by what's going on inside. And so external factors probably are not going to have much to do with it. Perfect. That's good to know. Thank you. Lindsay, do you have another yeah, one you want to cover? Sure. Um, somebody here would like to know if DH blisters initially appear hours or days after exposure to gluten, um, just to like a probably trying to figure out when they maybe got exposed. So is it, you know, within a couple of hours that they might start to show the signs or is it a couple of days? Do we know the answer to that? Yeah, I think it's more like a couple of days. All right. That makes sense. Um, my guess is they're trying to narrow in where they've been exposed and and uh, sometimes that's helpful in the process. Um, okay, let's see. And, so Dr. Stein, I feel like we're like peppering you. There are a lot of questions here and then very specific things. I think the takeaway that I've gotten today is this definitely is what I you know, is interesting to hear. One, I think as a celiac community, we're doing a better job of diagnosing. And so hopefully patients don't, but if you do have DH, this is a chronic disease or a chronic yeah, disease that you, a skin condition that you will have. Um, but I'm just looking at Lindsay, are there any others? I feel like we, we've definitely answered some of these in here in some way, shape or form. Are there any others that stick out that we'd like to ask Dr. Stein? Um, I don't think so. I think the majority of the ones that are left her have been discussed in some form or another already. But I think the importance I would like to also say is follow-up care with your gastroenterologist, with your dermatologist. It is a team approach in managing diseases like celiac disease, as well as conditions like DH. Um, and it's so important for follow-up care. I just want to give that plug because it will also help you answer some of these very specific scenarios um, in your quest of um, why you have a flare-up when you're exposed to gluten this time and the next time you don't. Um, I think it's also just working with your medical team. Dr. Stein, do you have any final thoughts you want to share as we kind of wrap things up this evening? Uh, no, I just want to thank you again for uh, allowing me to participate in this. And I hope I was informative and hopefully uh, people feel like they have a little empowered with a little bit more knowledge. This was amazing. Dr. Stein, we cannot thank you enough. This was such a very helpful conversation. I feel like people got a lot of information. Um, I just want to appreciate and Lindsay, thank you for putting this together was really informative. So I really appreciate this. It was fantastic. And if you didn't get your um, questions answered, definitely reach back out to us. But I hope, I think we addressed a lot of these things um, in some ways. Uh, I felt like we were on a game show where we were like, okay, Dr. Stein, here's the <laughs> next one. It's a little um, overwhelming. So thank you very, very, very much. Um, Lindsay, do you have any wrap up notes or thoughts? Just want to let everybody know that if they registered, I will follow up with an email in the next day or two. And like Rachel said, this was recorded. It will be on our YouTube channel. If you want to refer back to it, um, I will send that link in the email as well. Thank you, Dr. Stein, very much. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. This is right. fantastic. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Good night. Thanks. Good night.